activity which had been going on for close to a month. I'm, I'm dealing with a horrific murder here. I need the public's help to help me identify who the victim is. But it wasn't just the identity of the victim that the police were trying to establish. At a forensic science lab in Cambridgeshire, Ray Palmer was hoping to uncover more information about the murder itself and the culprits. The first task that we had in this investigation was to look at the debris which had been taken and recovered from all the deposition sites, from all the packages that had been used to wrap up the body parts, and to look at the debris to see if there was any associations which we could demonstrate between them that were common to them and may give some indication as to the last environment in which the deceased had been. Ray and the investigation team agreed a strategy that would involve analysing the tape that had been used to bind the sacking around the various body parts. The examination of the tapes consisted of us looking at these for what we call fibre collectives. Now, collectives are actually populations of fibres which could have a common origin and appear to have come from the same source. So our first task was really to look at the adhesive side of the tapes to see if there were any fibre collectives present which might give us to some clue as to the environment in which the body parts have been wrapped. The fibre evidence would only prove useful once the police had discovered who the victim was and where he was murdered. But as the forensics experts worked to find any evidence that would lead police to the victim, the police started to get a response to their media appeals. And it was one particular phone call that would be a key breakthrough. A member of Jeff's family, as a result of the media coverage, made direct contact with the incident room. Um, from the circumstances in which he'd gone missing, that raised Jeffrey as a potential person that could have been the victim. I then sent officers round uh, to Jeff's home address. When they arrived, there was no sign of Jeffrey Howe. But there were two people living at the property, Jeffrey's tenants, Stephen Marshall, and his 20-year-old girlfriend, Sarah Bush. Jeffrey and Stephen had worked together at one point as partners in a kitchen fitting business. In November 2008, Stephen and Sarah had fallen on hard times, so Jeffrey let them stay in his spare room. They had agreed to pay rent but shortly afterwards, they'd stopped making the payments and Geoffrey had asked them to leave. They refused to go. Officers of DSC and Sigury, plus others, attended the address in Southgate. Um, they spoke with Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall, who were both there, and basically weren't happy with the account they'd given in relation to why Mr Howe wasn't at the, at the location. The reaction that Marshall and Bush gave when my officers went round there was such that they were nervous, were being a little evasive. It caused concerns for the officers who then phoned up to say, well, OK, look, we're not happy with what we're being told. What do you want us to do? Sounds like a strange question, but a question where we don't know who the victim is at that stage. They made a cursory search of the address and secreted in one of the wardrobes was a number plate with the registration H8WEJ, which basically reads How J, which belonged to Geoffrey. And at that point, they obviously had quite um, huge concerns. Um, they made um, the decision to leave the address, regroup, and then the arrest was made um, quite soon after that. Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were taken to Hatfield Police Station for questioning. While they were in custody, forensics experts began to search for any evidence of murder in Geoffrey Howe's flat. But time was against them. If the police couldn't obtain significant evidence, the pair would have to be released after 24 hours. They're arrested for a murder that's happened, but we don't actually know that that murder has happened. But that then starts the clock in terms of how long we can keep people in custody. We needed to work at 100 miles an hour, literally, to get the evidence, because we hadn't gathered any evidence against them as individuals prior to their arrests. Initial 
looking at the flat didn't reveal that that was necessarily the murder scene because quite clearly a really thorough clean-up operation had taken place. It was only when we managed to start moving furniture around, pulling carpets up, that the forensic examination revealed that there was a quantity of blood in both the bedroom and the bathroom. So we believe that he was stabbed in the bedroom and then the dismemberment took place in the bathroom. As officers worked around the clock at the crime scene, Detective Constable Sue Burns was preparing to interview Stephen Marshall. When I first met Marshall, he came across as a charming, nice person, if I'm honest, and he actually kept that up throughout the time in police custody. Do you deny or confirm that it's Geoffrey Howe? No comment. Do you recognise that person to be Geoffrey Howe? No comment. When he was being interviewed, he took up his right to make no comment during the interviews, which um, is obviously legally allowed to do. Are you surprised to learn that Geoffrey Howe's been murdered? No comment. How did you feel when you found that he'd been murdered? No comment. I believe you think you're going to be dealing with someone that's kind of monster-like, and when you then get a man in front of you who isn't a monster, it's quite difficult to attribute what he's done um, or what's happened to this particular person. I believe he was a friend or an associate of yours. No comment. And my understanding is he's been quite kind to you in the past by allowing you to stay at his home address. No comment. Are you surprised that he's... As the no comments continued, you sit and think, well, if you haven't done this to your friend, who has? And if you haven't done this to your friend, why aren't you telling me you haven't done it? And as the interviews progressed, his guilt became more and more apparent. And do you feel upset by the fact that not only has he been murdered, but someone's chosen to dismember him and place parts of his body around the countryside? No comment. How does that make you feel? No comment. You've got no comment to make about that in any, in any shape or form? No comment. Okay. Bearing in mind, obviously, people will be listening to this tape, and he's a friend of yours, and most people, I would say, would be quite shocked by the fact that someone's been killed and dismembered. No comment. Throughout the whole of the interview, there was no remorse shown by Stephen Marshall. However, once the tape's finished, he was very courteous and very polite, and you know, and just seemed a, just a genuinely um, just normal person. Are you responsible for the killing and the dismembering of your friend, no Jeffrey Hale? Marshall and Bush were in custody, but at this stage, police hadn't been able to identify whether Jeffrey Howe was their victim or not. A thorough search of his flat had failed to provide any suitable items to take DNA from. And although Jeffrey had been flagged up by his brother to police as a missing person, he was adopted, so no DNA link could be established to his family. There were, however, other avenues to explore. We all have unique faces and unique skulls. So if we have enough information about the skull and the face, it's as characteristic as a fingerprint. Two people are still in police custody this evening in connection with the so-called jigsaw murder. The 37-year-old man and a woman aged 20 were arrested yesterday. Following the discovery of five body parts across Hertfordshire and Leicestershire in March and April 2009, police had arrested Stephen Marshall and his girlfriend Sarah Bush on suspicion of murder. Are you surprised that he's been murdered? No comment. What can you tell me in relation to his murder? No comment. Do you feel upset by his death? No comment. From the point of their arrest, Marshall made no comment to any questions put to him, so he, he didn't give us anything to work with. Bush gave an explanation, an explanation that was quite clearly uh, a web of lies. He seemed really lost. In what respect? Just didn't know what to do with himself. Just said, have you got that money for the rent? But neither admitted any involvement in the actual crimes. They were distancing themselves from the crime. The police still hadn't been able to identify a victim from the body parts but they strongly suspected it was Geoffrey Howe, Marshall and Bush's landlord. He had been adopted as a child, so familial DNA links couldn't be established. In Dundee, forensic anthropologists were trying to help police confirm the victim's identity. 
In this particular case, we looked at craniofacial superimposition, which means that you superimpose um, the skull with an anti-mortem image, a, a living image of the individual who's thought to be the victim. So what we do is we try and match up the shape and proportions of the skull with the shape and proportions of the face to see if there are similarities or differences. Using a photo of Geoffrey Howe and a CT scan of the skull recovered in Leicestershire, Caroline Wilkinson was able to manipulate the two images to try to establish a match. First of all, if we look at the outline of the skull in relation to the outline of the face, you can see that the um, shape of the upper head, the curve of the head, matches up very well between the skull and the face. We can see the position of the orbits match up perfectly. If we look at the nasal aperture, which is the hole where the nose sits, you can see that the width and length of that matches up to the soft nose. If we look at the teeth, the position of the lower incisors match up to the incisors seen on the photograph and also the overall width of the chin and shape of the jawline matches quite clearly. The work in Dundee strongly suggested the skull belonged to Geoffrey. And once an odontologist matched the teeth with dental records, Geoffrey Howe was publicly identified as the victim on April the 23rd. The following day, Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were charged with murder and remanded in custody pending a trial date. But the investigation team's work did not stop there. It was now down to other forensic experts to come up with evidence that would prove crucial when the case came to court. At the Forensic Science Service, Ray Palmer was analysing evidence to try and prove that Marshall was present at the time the murder and dismemberment took place. He wanted to focus primarily on the tape used to bind the plastic around the body parts. This photograph here um, shows the duct tape which had been used to wrap the body parts inside a blue rubble sack. So our first priority was actually to remove the taping from the rubble sack in a manner which would allow us to recover and preserve any evidence which was on the adhesive side of the tape. In this particular instance, this kind of tape was used, which obviously, because it's been rolled up, is fibre-free. Yeah. Because the tape's obviously been opened at the time to wrap the body parts inside the rubble bags, this means that the adhesive's exposed to the environment in which it's opened. And in this case, fibres from Stephen Marshall's environment have actually got onto the tapes at the time he's wrapped the items and what he's actually done is he sealed the evidence in himself. The various samples were removed and mounted on acetate films similar to this one to preserve the evidence. The fibres were so tiny they were highlighted by red circles so the experts could examine them more easily. Now many people think of fibre evidence, they think of it in terms of threads and what we're actually talking about here is the individual components of threads. But we're talking about sub-millimetre sized particles which are uh, very often much thinner than human hair. Ray found fibre collectives that he believed came from a blue object with a peach skin texture. Forensic officers at the murder scene looked for an item that fitted that description. We could link fibres from the tape used to wrap up the body parts to inflatable airbeds that we know that they bought, Bush and Marshall had bought, after Jeff's death because after the death, they got rid of the bed because the bed, we believe, was quite heavily bloodstained, bought some inflatable air beds, and fibres from those air beds are identical to the fibres that we've recovered off the tape that wrap up the body parts. This is a photograph of the, uh, one of the mattresses in question. And you can see it's, it's very much a typical sort of thing you buy at a camping store. And it has a plastic inflatable sheath on which flock has been applied to the top surface. We removed fibres from the surface and placed them on a microscope slide. There are a number of comparative features we can look at, one of which is the actual cross-sectional shape of the fibre itself. Some fibres are irregularly shaped, some are very round, some are oval. In addition to cross-sectional shape, there's a, a chemical process involved in the manufacture of fibres called delustrant. That's a process which actually stops the fibres shining. 
So these are all features we can actually look at and compare directly against a suspect item. Having identified a match between the two samples, 